Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I ask individuals who are in the room to make sure they put their mobile phones at least into a silent process so it doesn't interfere with proceedings. The first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to take item three in any future draft reports on the trade bill LCM in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Members are agreed. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence on the UK Trade Bill from Graham Kemp, the St Andrews TTP Action Group, Liz Murray, the head of the Scottish Campaign's Global Justice Now, Daphne Valastari, the Link Advocacy Manager for Scottish Environment, Link, and Claire Slipper, who is the Political Affairs Manager at NFU Scotland. I very warmly welcome all of our witnesses to our proceedings. This morning, I just want to ask a very general question to get the, the process underway, just in order to provide some context for, for the session. And I just wonder if you could outline what your principal concerns are around the Trade Bill for your own organisations in terms, for instance, environmental, agricultural, um, environmental issues, also in terms of accountability and transparency. And in addition, I'd appreciate it if you could give us your views on the restrictions the bill places on Scottish ministers and how you view the potential implications for the bill for devolved settlement um, from your own organisational perspective. I think that would be very helpful. So who would like to kick this session off? Claire, you're volunteering. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for inviting me to be here today. Um, so, so the trade bill, as far as we understood it, is intended to be a procedural bill that will deal with the issue of transitioning the EU's trade agreements to the UK arrangements, um, so therefore it's procedural in nature. However, we are very concerned as a first principle that we do not want the nature of its passing to set a precedent for the passage of future trade deals um, in terms of consult consultation with the devolved administrations. Um, for us, the key thing is um, maintaining trade that is transparent and inclusive, and in doing so, therefore, takes a formal um, consultative or possibly a consent approach to, um, to trade with both the devolved administrations and stakeholders as well, who are the experts. Um, we would do welcome the fact that the trade sets out that they're wanting to try and keep the UK legal framework as consistent as possible with the EU. Um, that's important to begin with because it sets a level of consistency. Um, we also set up. Uh, we also welcome the UK government's um, promise to set up trade remedies and disputes framework, which we think will be important for protecting uh, producers who are trading. However, um, we do question certain elements within the bill. Um, the outlines that they want to try and ma maintain very high standards of consumer protection, animal welfare, and environmental protection. However. I'm unsure how this then fits in with some of the dialogue that we've seen coming out of DIT in recent weeks and months as regards the lowering of tariffs and therefore the lowering of standards that we have here in, in Scotland and in the UK. Um, and finally, uh, just to kick things off, clearly the, the bill, what it allows is the UK Parliament to make changes to domestic legislation um, to fulfil obligations arising from future trade agreements by secondary legislation. Um, We've had a discussion in this committee already about um, the implications of this with, through the withdrawal bill and the concerns are exactly the same, um, particularly if changes to um, legislation that are done by secondary instruments are to things like non-tariff barriers. That would be extremely concerning for our sector because high standards are absolutely paramount. Um, so that's the first principle. Thank you, Claire. That's okay. very helpful. Graham? Right. So uh, a little bit of, of, of background will... We'll explain some of the views that I have. Our organisation is a, a, a town gown one in St Andrews involving students and um, members of the members of the public. And it started about four years ago when the first um, indications of TTIP became became available and we were very concerned about mainly the, the secrecy element to that. Um, and also the fact that, that there seemed to be very little role um, for uh, devolved assemblies in deciding what was, was going on in, 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 these, in these agreements. Um, our concern then switched to, to CETA as it was more imminent um, and um, there are some aspects of, of what is present in CETA um, that seem to us to be Potentially detrimental to Scotland, in, in particular, we're looking at it from a from a from a Scottish perspective. 
Um, the <coughs> main criticisms that we would have of the of the trade bill uh, as it stands at present is that it seems to cut away um, the influence of, of, of Scotland over matters which um, are done slightly differently in Scotland. And there is a danger in our view that this um, would, uh, um, the trade bill would undercut um, these, these, these areas. So simply it's, it's the lack of information and the lack of influence of, of um, the public as well in, in the way that these trade bills are, 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 uh, are set up, the trade deals are set up. Thank you, Graham. Yes, happy, happy to provide some um, comments. Thanks very much for the invitation uh, for today. Um, in terms of Scottish Environment Link, we're approaching the UK trade bill uh, from an environmental point of view, of course. And generally, there is some concern about free trade agreements in general that if not properly managed um, and, and sort of considered, there might be um, damaging effects to the environment, um, that it might lead to the sort of regulatory regression and as well um, kind of uh, effects to kind of our global footprint as a country. So in the context of the UK trade bill, we would like to see some changes made that put environmental protections um, on the face of the bill so that there is a certainty that there will be no changes to our domestic legislation um, to fit kind of future trade agreements. Um, I would echo some of the points that have been made already in terms of the role of Parliament and scrutinising and having oversight of trade agreements um, over the last few years. Because of our membership to the EU, those trade agreements have been negotiated at the EU level with the participation of the European Parliament and elected um, MEPs. I think we need to be revisiting our domestic structures in that respect and also take into account um, devolution with some sort of proposals, I think, that have already been um, put in place by the Welsh government. They've been proposed already. Um, what is worrying in terms of the UK trade bill is that, again, very much like the withdrawal bill, it includes a number of delegated powers, which to our reading of the bill would also allow um, for the review of primary legislation, uh, again, to make future trade agreements or existing trade agreements that will have to be sort of um, renegotiated um, sort of come to bear. Um, we understand that the UK government wanted to limit the scope of the current UK trade bill to the existing trade agreements that would have to be uh, renegotiated or adapted so that they function as the UK exits the EU um, and that there might be a separate policy coming about how the UK government will treat future trade agreements. Um, however, we think there is an urgency that the current bill um, seeks to address that already, because according to the transition deal that we have with the EU, the UK government will be already able to negotiate um, future and, and new trade agreements. Um, so I think I will, I will stop now. Um, Thanks, Daphne. Liz? Um, I think I'm going to echo what some of the others have said as well. Um, firstly, by saying thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm uh, here on behalf of Global Justice Now, but we are also part of the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition, um, which was set up in 2015 um, as part of the campaign against TTIP. So 27 organisations from some of the biggest trade unions, Unison, Unite, STUC, um, campaigning organisations and local activist groups as well. So we've been working together now since 2015. Um, and we... We started out with a concern about TTIP and CETA and this, this new wave of trade deals which are going beyond tariffs and quotas and into the realm of public policy space and into the realm of you know, democratic decision making. Um, uh, and and uh, to our view, are, are, are you know, slightly changing some of the rules of, of governance or global governance or, almost. Um, so with the, with the trade bill in particular, um, are we yes we would um, question the assumption about the transfer of deals so the the deals that the EU currently has with third party just being sort of cut and pasted if you like um, we um, having listened certainly to um, some of the um, evidence that was given in the committee the, pub, the trade bill committee down in Westminster there were others saying that they felt it very unlikely that it would be a simple cut and paste and that 
for, for a variety of reasons, those trade deals would get opened up to renegotiation on a variety of things. You've, we've seen it reported, um, you've seen that in our evidence, we've seen it reported from trade representatives from, from other countries um, who would be involved in those deals that they would want to look again at agricultural quotas and subsidies and, and various other things. So we feel that, um, th uh, that for this bill, um, the issue of parliamentary scrutiny is as important as it would be in any future trade bills, um, because there, are, there as, as Daphne said, there's an urgency to, uh, and there's a precedent that needs setting in this bill to have parliamentary scrutiny. So um, we, that should be at Westminster, obviously, but we also believe that, that, that the devolved administration should have a role in parliamentary scrutiny. And we made some specific suggestions in our um, in our evidence, um, including you know, a joint ministerial committee and a committee, some sort of committee process here, a legal right for, the, for you as MSPs to be able to see texts as they're negotiated, um, and uh, some, some sort of vote on, on a final, or, or perhaps using the, the LCM process for the final text. So there's a number of places where, um, where we feel that the devolved administration should absolutely be involved from the setting of the mandate and agreeing that if there's any changes to the mandate through to the agreement of the final trade deals. Um, and, um, and the reason we think that the devolved administration should be in involved, or the Scottish Parliament in this case, is, is because of the scope and the extent of, the, of trade deals like TTIP. Um, and we have no reason to believe that the UK government wouldn't be using um, TTIP has some sort of um, template, um, for example, for a trade deal with the with the US, um, and uh, you know Scotland has regularly um, passed legislation and um, that's stronger in areas than the, than other parts of the UK. You know we have banning smoking in public places was done here before it was done in the rest of the UK. There's the extended moratorium on fracking, GM crops. Um, you know, we have a different approach here to our public services, so the, um, that, that's for us where it's the impacts of those trade deals um, and the, the, uh, the extensiveness of those that mean we feel it's really important that the Scottish Parliament and MSPs have a say. Thank you, Liz. Adam. Thank you, Camino, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for being with us. I mean, I, this is um, clearly a set of issues which is going to be quite challenging for the devolution settlement going, going forward, but I wonder if I could go back to basics on the devolution settlement and just make sure that we, um, or just find out if we all agree um, on at least the starting point, if not on the, on, on the destination. Um, um, so would the members of the panel agree with the proposition that international relations, international treaty making, and including the making of international trade agreements are matters which are reserved to Westminster? I think we're all agreed um, that um, uh, international trade um, in the future must respect the devolution settlement but respecting the devolution settlement means respecting that which is reserved to Westminster, as well as respecting that which is devolved to um, uh, Holyrood or indeed to Cardiff Bay. So the, my first question is, do you agree with the proposition that international trade is a matter which is reserved under our constitutional law to Westminster? You're looking Liz, at me. When you're looking at all of you. <laughs> and, and you should feel free to answer, but Liz, if you want to just kick um, off. Yes. Uh, I've heard you ask every witness so far the same question, <laughs> um, so I assume you know the answer. Um, I know what, my, I know what my answer is. I'm yes. interested in your okay, answer. You just want views. Well, yes, trade is reserved, but <laughs> as, you know, as we've heard, the, the whole issue of Brexit is, is, is a test of, of the institutions of devolution and the fact that the, the, these trade deals, in a way that perhaps many previous trade deals have not, have now a wider impact. Um, and um, and the UK has ha it, it's a, something new to negotiate trade deals for the UK because we've been part of the EU before, and um, and we don't yet have a, a proper process for that. So here's a chance to do that. It may have some implications and some difficulties in terms of devolution, but I think it's important. Okay. So the, the, is there any dissent from this view? that um, international trade is reserved to Westminster, but the content of modern international trade agreements and international trade treaties may uh, touch on, may more than touch on, um, devolved issues. Is that, is that the view that every member of the panel would take? Defer to your experience as a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, I'm just an ordinary member of the public. You've still got a view, so <laughs> our job is to have Yeah, but my, have view on the, my view on the law um, 
is, is tempered by what I think it should be rather than than what it actually is. So um, I, I um, will defer to your um, much greater experience in this in, in this area. But it, even allowing that, it does not preclude um, the fact that, that there should be proper consultation and agreement between all the the um, constituent nations of the United Kingdom. We have been told that, that we're equal partners in the Union, and that would mean, to my understanding of it, is that we should have more than just a say, but our views should be taken into account in um, future, future trade deals. Because there are a number of areas, and Liz has touched on some of them, where Scotland does things differently. And um, there's talk of, of uh, retaining some of the the powers coming back from from Westminster, coming back from Brussels, retaining them in Westminster in order to create um, common frameworks. And um, our view is that there's a danger to Scotland's distinct identity from a unilateral imposition of common frameworks. So um, while um, I have to accept uh, your uh, your, your view on it, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's absolutely correct. Uh, there are ways of doing it, and the trade bill does not, in my view, uh, give enough say to the devolved assemblies. Claire, Daphne, you want to comment on that as well at this stage? Just a, a really small point, and actually it's just on the point of common frameworks that you just raised there, is that I, I do agree that these areas are reserved to Westminster, but what this bill is doing is setting up a new but setting the groundwork for a new trading framework that we will operate after we leave the EU. And it comes back to the points that we have raised in previous evidence to this committee about commonly agreeing those frameworks and the nature in which it is done. Um, so it's, it's for us, it wouldn't be about saying that, um, uh, about redevolving these powers. It's just about the nature in which you find common agreement. Um, what, I'm, what I would also add is that my understanding is that the EU Parliament will be able to vote on new trade deals that the EU strikes. So, um, but what this bill does is sort of takes away um, that step in terms of having the, the parliamentary scrutiny aspect as well, which is an important step to miss. Daphne? Yeah, I just wanted to add something very quickly. In terms of international obligations, you're quite right, the UK is negotiating those. But when it comes to the implementation, as far as devolved matters are concerned, of course, it's the devolved governments and sort of parliaments that have this. So insofar as new and existing trading arrangements impact our ability to meet international obligations, you could argue that there is a bit of an overlap or an, um, an area we would need to at least consider the implications. Um, and I think this is um, our particular concern. If new and existing trade arrangements are going to be changed in a way that potentially impacts our ability to um, adopt future environmental legislation to protect nature um, and climate, or um, to perhaps regress on some of these environmental commitments. I think that's where you see some overlap and some of these issues need to be concerned. That, that, that's very helpful. I mean, the deference is flattering, but please don't defer to me. I'm asking you these questions because I'm genuinely interested in your responses to them. You know, I already know what I think, but I want my, I want my thoughts to be informed by, by, by your evidence. Look, so the, 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 I, I asked in that question whether you accept that um, international trade being reserved is the starting point. C clearly, the force of your evidence is that even if it is the starting point, it's not the end point. It's not the whole of the story. It's more complicated than that. So the issue is, how do we um, uh, construct in the devolved United Kingdom um, uh, uh, institutions, organizations, um, ways of doing business, ways of making policy, ways of implementing policy, which respect the devolution settlement in terms of understanding that we are talking essentially about reserve policy, whilst also understanding that the making of this reserve policy might directly impact on matters which are devolved in Scotland, Wales, and perhaps also uh, in Northern Ireland. Now, one of the many organisations that has been looking quite carefully at this, and it's a puzzle, it's a conundrum, it's not going to be straightforward in my view um, uh, to get this right, but one of the organisations which has long expertise in this and has, um, uh, has been looking at it for a long time and recently published what I thought was quite an interesting report on it is the Institute for Government, which is based in London. And I wonder if you agree with one of the recommendations or conclusions that was made um, by the Institute for Government in its most recent report on this, which is to say this, that UK-wide legislation um, will provide greater certainty for businesses and third country trading partners, either by setting legally enforceable outcomes or through detailed regulations. 
and that when it comes to areas that are likely to be important features of future trade relationships, UK-wide legislation would reassure international partners that the UK is going to meet what it calls its side of the bargain. So there's quite strong evidence from the IFG, from the Institute for Government, that trade legislation is and should be a matter for UK-wide legislation and not for separate legislation in each of the component nations of the United Kingdom. To what extent do you agree with those recommendations from the IFG? I personally wouldn't agree with them. Um, I think if you take it just as, as you read it, and I haven't read the report, um, and um, when you get to my age, your short-term memory begins to fail a little bit, so I may not recall exactly what you said just now. Um, but it does not seem to accept that the different nations, Wales, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, have different practices in some areas, and that must be, in, in our view, respected. Uh, and so that, that it's not possible to get a UK-wide uh, um, policy on all, all issues that would be covered by, would be covered by a trade deal. Um, our experience with um, CETA in particular um, showed that there were some areas where the UK government did not seem to be taking into account uh, important differences that, that occur in, in, in Scotland. Um, for example, uh, the, the question of geographical indicators and products of designated origin. They are proportionately more important to um, Scotland than they are to the rest of the United Kingdom. Something like 15 to 18 per cent of the 70 odd GIs and PDOs that, that um, are recognised in the UK uh, by the European Union um, are in Scotland. So proportionately it's, it's more important to, to Scotland than the rest of the country. But the UK, in negotiating CETA, did not think to protect any of these at all, none in England and none in Scotland. There was absolutely nothing in the list that they, that they presented. Um, the NHS is, is something that's, that's always uh, brought out as well. Um, and um, if you look at... The, CETA operates are what, in our view, is a very dangerous approach, the negative list, where if you want something protected against liberalisation or privatisation, then it has to appear on either an, on, an, on Annex 1 to the, to the CETA agreement. Um, and in that Annex 1, under the Health Services, um, Health and Veterinary Services section, there is no mention of Scotland or Scottish. These words don't appear. And this prompted us to ask um, if our uh, MSP, uh, Mark Ruskell, would, would ask a question on, on this. And he did in the Scottish Parliament. And the answer that uh, came from Keith Brown was that they'd taken legal advice and no, the Scottish NH NHS was not protected uh, under, under CETA. Um, so that there are areas like that, and, and there are perhaps one or uh, two other examples that could be quoted, where the UK government does not seem to be taking account of the differences in Scotland. And that's where, that's evidence, if you like, that, that there's a danger in uh, excluding the um, devolved assemblies from uh, um, having a say in the, in the negotiating mandate and having a say in uh, what eventually what eventually appears. I think that's very important. Okay, Liz, do you want to, or Daphne? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the so the the, the UK would a trade deal would be at a UK level, um, if uh, like they are at an EU level at the moment. Um, but we we are concerned about the process of of arriving at and agreeing that trade deal. Um, and that's where we think the devolved administration, the Scottish Parliament, I'm going to, I'll, I'll stick to that in, in my, the way I describe it, um, that that's where there needs to be a, um, a role and um, some, you know, with some very specific things. So, for example, a joint ministerial committee that reaches consensus on the mandate beforehand, of the negotiating mandate, um, and you know, a negotiator from each of the devolved areas of, the, of Scotland on the negotiating team for a, um, for a trade deal. Um, the ability for um, members of the, of the Scottish Parliament to be 
as I said, given a legal right to see the negotiating text along the way and, um, and a role in scrutinising those and recommending um, changes. <clears throat> and that would be similar, uh, and there would be a similar process going on in Westminster, obviously, and that, that um, mirrors in some ways the EU sc um, scrutiny committee. Um, a role for civil society, um, but also the, the, even though it's perhaps imperfect, the legislative consent motion process um, as well to what, once the negotiations are completed um, because we think the Scottish Parliament absolutely needs to be able to, um, to to look at and raise issues around any impacts that a trade deal might have on, on your own powers and um, the impacts in, the, in, in Scotland itself and um, and then the, we think there should be a five-year review period in trade deals as well and again the Scottish Parliament should get involvement in that um, in order to assess the impact that it's having here and, if necessary, to, to propose changes or even um, recommend to the UK Parliament that the UK withdraws from a trade deal. So, so we have, that there are suggestions. Um, they may all, not all be absolutely um, possible, but that's what we would suggest, that need, there needs to be a, real, you know, a really comprehensive process along the way to ensure that the Scottish Parliament has not, not just to say, but um, you know, kind of a, a um, more more of a role than just to say. Definitely clear. Can I just add a yeah, something very quickly. I would echo Liz's points on the process and the involvement, um, also from default parliaments. Um, the one thing that I think is very important to highlight, I think, if we're talking about the same report um, that was, I think, also funded by RSPB and WF, um, I think the report also concluded that the Brexit process has highlighted some changes that we need to make in the institutions that support devolution. Um, and I think that goes back to, you know, our, our mechanisms and our, you know, process fit for purpose. Um, so that takes us back to the JMC process, involvement of parliaments. Um, so I appreciate that there's a whole host of recommendations coming out from the report and they should be looked at um, altogether. Yeah, it was a similar point, actually, just, yeah, I think this report is actually, it's a really, really helpful addition to the debate, and I have read what I can of it, but, and, yeah, I, I take the point that you make in the report, I think a UK-wide framework on something like trade is important, they will be set at UK-wide structures, um, however, it's, it's about setting a level playing field, but then allowing certain aspects to play different rules of the game, and as much as it does say it's important to have sort of common standards across it then does go on to say that when legislation is required, it should be passed with consent, keeping amendments to the devolution settlements to a minimum. And when legislation is not required, it shouldn't, um, that they, sh they, they should bring in a form of um, concordat protocol or memoranda of understanding between the four nations as well. So again, it goes back to this point that I made about the nature in which you find common agreement is extremely important. Um, and I think the example of the JMC has been raised. We would agree that that needs some real teeth to allow um, you know, the four parts of the UK to feel that they have been consulted and given agreement to, to these quite fundamental issues. So. That, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. I was going to ask one final question, but you've already anticipated it. And the, the final question was going to be um, to make exactly the point that Claire's just made, which is the, the IFG do say that where such UK legislation is made, it should be made with consent. And the question was going to be, do you think using that um, LCM process, that legislative consent, mechanism process that we that we have and we've had for 20 years is sufficient um, to um, protect what you identify as the distinct uh, interests of Scotland in this process and Liz has already answered that question very fully with a whole series of reasons why she thinks that it isn't on its own sufficient it's necessary but not sufficient um, and so that's very helpful thank you very much now, Ivan I know you wanted to get into international comparisons but because the issue of scrutiny is already in the in the discussion I think we should probably go there first um, Patrick. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, I guess, sorry, just marshalling my thoughts. I was expecting to, to come in a bit later. Um, I think just picking up on, on something that, that Adam uh, argued, that the starting point should be an acknowledgement that international trade uh, is reserved. Uh, it, it seems to me that that might be slightly um, beside the point. The Constitution is reserved. Uh, yet there is a constraint on the UK government in its use of that reserved power. It's not allowed to uh, change the devolved competencies without the consent of the devolved parliaments. And so similarly, the, the, the use of a reserved power on trade 
uh, it seems to me should be seen in the same light, that there should be a constraint on the, the use of that reserved power if it affects devolved competences, which, uh, as, as Les Murray has argued, a lot of the, the modern trade uh, agreements do and, and will. Um, I wonder if you would agree with another recommendation from the Institute for Government uh, that in negotiating, uh, in, in coordinating UK-wide input into international negotiations, the UK should look to international examples, particularly the involvement of the Canadian provinces uh, in the negotiations between the EU and Canada. Um, is, is that a model that would satisfy uh, the needs that, that, you're, that you're talking about? And what is, the, what is the opportunity for democratic engagement, not just by parliamentarians, but by, by members of the public and other organisations, in the absence of such an arrangement? Um, the, yep, so the, the model um, of, in Canada with the provinces um, seems a very sensible one. <laughs> um, from... Um, from the point, particularly from the point of view of uh, actually of making the negotiations smoother from both sides, and I believe it was the EU that requested um, that, that, that the provinces were involved, and they, they were involved at an, at an early stage and, and along the way. So some of the recommendations that, that we've made we've, you know, is, is based on what we've seen and read and heard about what's, what's happened in Canada. Um, um, and so, uh, what was the second? What was the second part of the question? If Sorry. The bill, if the bill was to go through <coughs> as it stands, you know, this, this Parliament will be asked if we if we're going to give legislative consent. Uh, if we were to give that, and the bill was to go through as it stands, what are the opportunities that would exist? To what extent is there any space or scope for democratic engage, engagement, either by parliamentarians or by members of the public and, and other organisations? Oh, um, my understanding is very little. Um, that uh, that the at, at the moment um, the way that trade deals is so CETA for example is ratified in the UK is through um, the use of the Ponsonby rule, um, which uh, uh, whereby the, and it hasn't ha it hasn't been ratified yet through the UK Parliament but where the text is laid before Parliament for 21 days and you can ra M MPs can raise a question or, or an objection which has to be responded to by the government. Um, and, but that doesn't change what happens. That just that just um, initiates another 21 days, during which time you can raise an objection or question, <laughs> and you can maybe go on until one side gives up or something. I don't know exactly what the <laughs> what the outcome of that is likely to be. But there's no uh, be because we haven't the UK hasn't negotiated its own trade deals all this time. We um, but we um, but e even as part of the e um, as part of an EU process and the process of negotiating EU trade deals, that's not good enough. We think. It, there's no role at all for the public. Um, there's and there's that only that very limited rule for um, role for MPs. So even within the current system, it's not good enough. So, um, but the UK will be negotiating deals on its own. So now's the time to change that. Practically lower bill. level of of scrutiny and democratic engagement than happens at the European Parliament, for yes, example, in, in relation to the, exactly. the debates that took yeah. place on TTIP. Yeah, yeah. So losing that aspect of it will be will be a long way behind. So it's it's really not a radical ask for MPs at the very least to have much more say and for there to be some public scrutiny. There's many examples of where that happens, you know, and, and through the, with the Danish Parliament with a lot of their international um, the, the international policy that goes through the Parliament in some detail and has public consultation. So it's that's not a radical ask, um, and n neither actually I think is that is in, in principle is expecting or um, wanting the devolved administrations to have a say as well. Okay, just briefly with. And if you yeah, but, uh, yeah, but let's be sure to that question. Just ask. Well, uh, uh, can, can, we, can, can we get the others to answer the question? The first one. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. Just make sure we get all that. No problem. If, if you want to contribute, are you happy with the contribution from Liz? I'm first, yeah. Right, you're happy with that. Okay, on you go, Patrick. Well, yeah, just one specific aspect of this to the NFU in particular, as you know, as a Scottish aspect of a of a wider UK body. Um, one, a, one aspect of this debate is about the devolved administrations, the devolved parliaments, uh, and that level of devolved input where, where trade agreements would impact on, on devolved competencies. But another aspect is the, is the democratic principle in general. Um, 
is the NFU beyond NFU Scotland expressing the same concerns around democratic scrutiny, uh, irrespective of the, the, the devolved uh, issue? Uh, what's, what's that wider engagement that, that's coming from your perspective on, on the scrutiny aspects of the, the, the trade bill and the, the, the agreements that would be negotiated under it? Um, well, actually, we... We are an, a separate organisation from the English and Welsh NFU. We're kind of we're sisters, but not part of part of the same. So I beg your you pardon. Know, no, no, just a point of clarification in case there was any confusion. But um, but we do speak with them very regularly, and we are almost on the same page on a, a whole range of issues. But sometimes there are areas of difference. Um, but I spoke to my counterparts there yesterday in preparation for this session, and um, for them. As I said in my opening remarks, they do see this as a procedural bill, but they have raised the same concerns that I have about the lack of parliamentary scrutiny. I think particularly because clearly our concern is trade in agri-food products and with them being perishable in nature and the fact that you can't turn farming on and off <laughs> overnight. They're, they're worried about any sort of impact that could lead to trade flows being disrupted. Um, they have actually in evidence to... Um, DIT and to parliamentary committees raised a concern about lack of devolved input as well, which is welcome as far as we're concerned. Um, so, so we're, we're in a very similar place. Uh, just if I can, I just answer the, the question that you raised about the ca Canadian example. And I have to be completely honest, it's not something which we have spent a huge amount of time examining just purely because of resource constraints. But I suppose one thing that I would, uh, what, what, slightly, what does slightly concern me is about introducing as much as kind of scrutiny and democratic engagement is extremely important and we are keen to see that instilled within the process, we are worried about instilling another layer in which um, trade deals or trade in the future might have to go through. And I'm just thinking in terms of the practical nature of um, when you're importing or exporting, you need things like export certification, official vets, um, customs arrangements. And I, I would just worry about it becoming another layer in which there could be divergence between the UK and Scotland and other parts of the UK which could then disrupt trade flows. Which ties into I think another point that Adam Tompkins was making that uh, for, from a, the, the point of view of the, the interests of those taking part in international trade, uh, UK wide regulations and legislation would be would be beneficial. That seems mm -hmm. to me very clearly an argument for staying inside the single market uh, and doing away with the fragmentation that Brexit creates altogether. <laughs> Okay. We, yeah. Yeah. We we did we, we were clear from the outset that we would have preferred to stay within the single market in the customs union. That's a matter of record. But makes a great deal of sense. We are where we are. <laughs> okay. Willie. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, it's just to continue with this uh, theme about um, transparency and accountability. We, we we live in strange times indeed that we're having to make a case to someone to to give us the opportunity to scrutinise things and to hold things to to account. <laughs> Um, do, do you fear that we're in danger of repeating the mistakes of the TTIP process with this bill where as there was a huge public concern about it right across the European Union, not just in the UK, about the lack of transparency and engagement by the parliaments uh, and the public in this kind of process? Do you, do you agree with that, that we're potentially at risk of repeating that mistake? And give us one or two examples, please, of how we should resolve it, because it's not just a Scottish issue. There's no scrutiny and accountability at the UK level either, as I understand it. So firstly, do you agree with that? And secondly, how can we make this a better process? This is the, the concern that first got us interested in, in, in TTIP and then in, in CETA. We couldn't believe uh, that these negotiations were done in, in secret, and even uh, MEPs and MPs and, and MSPs had no idea as to what was, what was going on. Uh, and we've, um, as part of our, our process, um, we went to, to Brussels um, to lobby our MEPs there. Um, we took a delegation down to Westminster to uh, speak to um, MPs there, and we've attended um, debates in the, in the Scottish Parliament and uh, asked our local representatives to raise, raise questions on this. Um, and at the risk of seeming obsequious, the, 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 the best response has come from the Scottish Parliament. Um, this is a really, in comparison to the other two, a very open, engaging and friendly, friendly institution, um, which has been a big help in, in 
uh, um, elucidating what goes what goes on. But I think um, the premise of your question is 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 correct, and and the example of what has happened very recently with CETA is 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 a good example of that. Um, the Secretary of State for International Trade promised before the European Scrutiny Committee that there would be a debate on the floor of the House um, on CETA, um, and uh, that was in last, I think, November 2016 um, or thereabouts, uh, and it never happened. The only debate that, that, that occurred uh, subsequent to that was a, a small committee which met in the committee room exactly at the same time as the main uh, body of the parliament was, was debating the Article 50. Um, so the chances of that getting any publicity or even much interest um, was uh, minimal. And it just seemed to, to us that this was being snuck through um, on, the, on, on, on the quiet um, and there was no uh, no debate on this. And as far as I'm aware, before the CETA bill was published, there was no information available to the to the public um, before it was put online. Um, I think the, the the previous the previous year. So I think there is a danger um, that there will continue to be a lack of a lack of scrutiny of of, of trade deals. Yes, I just want to add that I think TTIP is perhaps an example of how not to do um, a trade deal. And again, it speaks to the transparency, the involvement of stakeholders, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think if we look at the current trade bill, which of course talks about existing um, trade agreements, it does not talk about how we will conduct those in the future, which is very worrying, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, given that you know, as of April next year, the UK will be able to negotiate new trade agreements and we will have no idea about how this is going to happen uh, by the existing sort of limited domestic mechanisms. Um, so I think what's quite important is to look also at the uh, TTIP in the context of the regulatory divergence that it would have created. Um, so I think looking at the US system, for instance, on environmental protections, food safety, um, we are in a, in a different space. Um, just a few weeks ago, the Scottish Parliament voted in favour, I think unanimously, on maintaining EU environmental principles with the precautionary principle at the heart of those. Um, we know that the US uh, regulatory systems do not operate on the basis of the same principles. Um, so looking forward to sort of future trade agreements, I think we need to um, already know that those should not be uh, used as an argument for uh, diluting standards. Um, for going back on environmental commitments. And I think, again, if you look at the current UK trade bill, um, it allows for primary legislation to be changed so that we can um, continue with those existing retrofitted trade agreements with, with third countries, which is very worrying. And so in looking um, at, at the trade bill, we would want some um, amendments made to ensure that this doesn't happen. Any non-technical amendments to existing trade deals should be properly scrutinised and in our view should be accompanied by a sustainability impact assessment that looks at the social, economic and environmental implications. And we think that this is a commitment that needs to be taken forward when conducting new trade deals. Um, and we would be looking for a much more robust um, process in conducting those with Parliament, definitely at Westminster, um, setting and voting on the terms of the, the mandate for the UK government to negotiate trade deals, um, for there to be a public consultation, uh, for Parliament to have a, a final vote to reject or um, agree on the, on the negotiated deal. And throughout the course of the negotiations for the Trade Committee at the UK level, the Select Trade Committee, to be commenting and feeding back on the negotiations. Um, and again, I think as Liz mentioned, some very important um, sort of considerations in terms of the role of devolved governments and parliaments. And we would like to see, um, you know, at each stage of the process to assess how Scottish Parliament and government can be implicated. Because I think, again, if you look at CETA, um, the, I think the... Um, concerns that were raised on the side of sort of Belgium happened at very late in the process and I think you'd want to avoid a situation where we're about to finalise and conclude a trade agreement and then something comes up at that final stage. You'd want to have those issues raised and flagged up front. Anybody else want to make any more comments? 
Liz? Thank you. Um, yes, I think um, if we ignored what happened with TTIP, if politicians ignore that, then um, they're, then they're daft and they'll be asking for trouble another time um, you know, in, in the future, really, because it was, um, I think everyone was taken aback, actually, with the amount of public opposition across, so, you know, three and a half million people signing a petition across Europe on that issue, and people in, in Berlin, 250,000 people marching against TTIP, and we had, you know, in this country where we don't have such big marches often on those sorts of things, we even we had tens of thousands of people, of people in London marching on that. Um, and the public understood what it was. You know, even those te technical issues, um, the public really, when they understood, they could absolutely see the, um, the, the sort of, you know, the injustice in the lack of transparency, but actually the problems with these deals as well. Um, so we, it, that lesson needs to be learned, and the trade bill offers an opportunity to do that. We, we could ch amend the trade bill to to allow, um, you know, if, if we if it if we're saying we need impact assessments, which we are looking at different sectors and different parts of the country, then based on that, there should be a public consultation at that early stage, um, and um, and and as part of that, you have to make proper efforts to reach out to, in particular, the sectors of society that are going to be impacted. And the, that's where the impact assessments will help do that. Um, and then the outcome of that consultation has to be taken into account um, about in, in making a decision as to whether that trade deal should should even go ahead or how the negotiations should then be shaped. Um, and we would also suggest setting up a civil society um, consultation, um, a civil society consultation body for trade deals. Um, and um, but with civil society deciding itself who should be included in that. Um, so, and from the point of view of, of you guys as MSPs and MPs, um, you, know, you also need to, you, you, another reason why you need to be involved in the process is so that you can engage with your own constituents. So when they come and ask you, you know, what about farming in, or, you know, what about the food labelling or whatever, you know, whatever they're, or what about the NHS and this trade deal, you can you can answer them not just by saying, you know, well, we'll try and find out about it or whatever. You can, you know, you you know that you've got something um, in more detail and something um, with more substance that you can go back to them with. Okay. Willie, okay, thank you. Neil, yeah, yeah. we've discuss, we're discussing parliamentary scrutiny. <coughs> it's already been mentioned the possible role of uh, joint ministerial committees um, in terms of. Uh, uh, trade. Uh, the GMB trade union, and I should declare I'm a member of the GMB, um, have said that they were interested by the suggestion of the Welsh administration for a UK Council of Ministers uh, of the Nations and believe that if this structure was developed to assure transparency and scrutiny, it could lend itself well to the development of future UK trade policy. Can I ask if you, you agree with the GMB? Have you considered the Welsh uh, administration's proposals in that regard? It's a good idea, provided that any such council has um, teeth, has the ability to make its views acted on, and is not just um, something that can be ignored. Any further yeah. comments? We would agree. Um, it's something which we've been considering for quite some time. It would work well across a whole range of issues. Um, for us, the important thing being future agricultural policy frameworks. Um, but the suggestion of possibly introducing some sort of qualified majority voting system as well has been um, mooted, and we would be interested in that. Um, a further suggestion, which I think my colleagues at the Scotch Whiskey Association have put on the table, is um, a mechanism which I believe actually operates in America, but um, it's, there's basically a statutory requirement to consult stakeholders on new trade deals where they will impact those sectors. So, for example, if it's a trade deal with the US and uh, the issue of hormone treated beef is on the table, then the NFU and NFUS would have a formal consultative role um, within the process of that trade deal before it's signed off, which I thought was quite an interesting idea as well. So. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to continue in this area uh, but about because a number of mentioned issues to do with negotiations. James, did you, did you have a question in this area as well? Sorry. I want to come in in procurement. Right, okay. <coughs> Ash, you, you, I think the, the particular role of the government in negotiation, mm -hmm. I think it was the area you were concerned about. I was. I was interested in the, what role the panel thought that the Scottish Government should have in negotiations, but I think some of that was covered in response to Adam Tompkins' question at the start. So I just want to drill down a little bit into how I see it would go if things went a little bit further down in the process. So if, you know, with the potential for investor protection clauses in future trade deals, it means that Scotland would have, uh, in Les Murray's uh, written submissions, words inextricably be linked to any trade deal 
signed by the UK that Scotland would be in that position where they would be fully impacted by that. So that being the case, obviously we've mentioned, or the panel have mentioned, a number of uh, procedures, um, structures that could be put in place, and we've just spoken about the Joint Ministerial Committee on Trade, something like that being set up. Um, this committee has looked at intergovernmental relations across the UK um, on a number of occasions already, and we have taken evidence um, previously that the JMC process as it currently stands, doesn't work that well. So I suppose we'd be, we'd be continuing down that road. So I, I guess I'm seeking the panel's view that if there was something like a JMC for trade set up, and we're in a position where they're negotiating these trade deals, and the Scottish government feel that the trade deal that's on the table that the UK government have put forward um, is not good for Scotland, you know, it doesn't protect Scotland's unique position or Scotland's um, interests, and there was a disagreement there, do you think it's enough for Scotland just to have, um, to use Claire Slipper's words, really fed into the process? Or do you think that the UK government should be able to proceed with that trade deal if the Scottish government didn't give consent to it? My initial reaction would be no. <laughs> they shouldn't be able to proceed. Okay. That we are, and we have been told we're an equal part of the union and that, that should be treated as such. To be able to, for the Scottish Government to be able to refer to the Parliament, right? actually, rather than acting in the same way that we want the UK Government to have to refer to the UK Parliament over these trade deals, and for MPs to have a say, then I would want whatever position the Scottish Government took to um, come from the, from the Parliament or be or, you know, authenticated, authorised, whatever, by the Parliament. Sure. Um, it's a... It's a, it's a I, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to answer whether the Scottish... So I guess if I'm saying if I'm saying if we're saying that the Parliament should have a say, then um, I think this Parliament should should um, be able to give its consent or withhold its consent um, um, on particularly on the areas of a trade deal that are, that are impacted on the devolved powers that it has that are impacted. Um, I don't have the expertise. The legislative consent motion process is what exists at the moment, and it's not perfect. But I don't have the expertise to suggest what, <laughs> you know, what, what could, if if you were trying to make something better, how to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I can offer a solution, but again, I think the, the Welsh government's approach uh, was that JMC type of uh, council of minister type of thing should also be created for reserved matters, which again speaks to the fact that there might be some overlap. Um, perhaps looking at it from an environmental point of view, um, if there is a, a trade agreement on the table that impacts on environmental legislation in Scotland, we would like to see a role for Scottish Government and Parliament in that. Um, again, that speaks to this overlap. Um, and again, the Civil Convention sort of comes into play there again. Um, but we would want um, potential discrepancies and issues to be fleshed out up front. So there would need to be some sort of mechanism that allows for that. And again, we've developed some ideas about how this could function at Westminster, but we would want to look at how it could potentially apply as well to Scottish Parliament. Um, to what's been said. Okay. Okay, Ash. Um, well, we're just to finish this off this area, I think Ivan had questions around what international examples could be used to help us through some of this process before I move on to other, other areas. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, convener, and thanks, panel, for uh, coming along and talking to us this morning. Um, it was exactly that, and I know some of you have put in your submission some examples from um, there's US examples, Belgium, we've talked about Canada, so we've kind of skirted around this, so I'd be interested to get your um, any input you want to make or any thoughts you have on what we can learn from other countries that have got subnational legislatures, be it a federal system or whatever system, um, and how they operate in this environment with respect to the trade deals that are made at a national level, and what kind of input or, or, or ability to direct those or influence those that, that exist at the, at the subnational level internationally. Shall I, shall I? I haven't got very. I haven't really got very much to add to what I, what I've already said. And what's in our so what was in our evidence was um, it was the the Canadian example, and then there's the the um, Belgian example. And um, 
uh, and then the US, which has been mentioned as well, and in Germany, there's a there's um, an interaction between the lender and the um, and the national government. Um, on on the issue of Wallonia, it, which um, obviously there's a different federal d um, a different federal setup in Belgium, but the kind of uh, the the principle that it showed was that um, by allowing the um, some say for the um, regional governments, they were able to respond. They had an eight, actually had an 18-month inquiry into CETA before they put in their objection, um, and that was and, and they had an impact assessment done. And they they were what they did was in response to what their to what their constituents were saying and what their farmers were saying, and their farmers were worried about the competition from agribusiness in Canada. So they were it allowed that regional government to respond to. To, the, to its local concerns and to the concerns of its constituents, which is really, if we're talking about a democratic process of transparency and all that kind of thing, that's, you know, that's an example of really what it is we're talking about. Um, and then through the processes they had, they were able to, the, the, the Belgian government was then able to refer that back to, um, to, to get some changes made. And also they've, they've also referred the whole ISDS thing to the European Court of Justice. Um, and in fact, there's been a, on on that actually, we would say that the, the ISDS shouldn't be included in these um, trade deals. So um, that, and that I know that the um, Scottish government or Nicola Sturgeon has certainly said she doesn't wouldn't support trade agreements that have that in, or they shouldn't be in those in trade agreements. So that could be quite a sticking point, um, and test the kind of thing you were just um, asking about, Ash. But um, uh, but yeah, that's uh, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm. I'm kind of giving a very circuitous answer, but I think it, it sort of reinforces the the, the principle of um, the need for um, for for more devolved decision making on these on these trade deals, so that the so that the concerns of constituents and parts of society and the economy that are going to be impacted to be properly taken into account. So, 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 so I suppose what we're saying there is that yes, there are some solid examples there that work perfectly well that we could learn from and we, we could use substantial parts of to influence the way we should operate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Potentially there are, yeah, there absolutely okay. are. Yeah. Great. Okay, <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll get into some specific areas now. That's been quite a, 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 a general discussion about the, the frameworks. Um, Alexander and Emma both want to talk about areas in agriculture in particular, Alexander. Uh, thank you, convener, and can I note my register of interest around farming. Um, I think we all recognise the importance of agricultural trade uh, and the importance of a good trade deal. Um, there's been much negativity on the ability to get such a deal, uh, but little focus on the importance of such a deal for other countries, I'm thinking of Ireland in particular, uh, and also sector specific. I see in this edition of Farm Northeast uh, that the volume of French maize that makes its way into the, the whiskey industry. Um, I just wondered what work or discussions NFU Scotland uh, had had, uh, and what was the likelihood of you uh, producing a similar document to the one uh, you did? Um, steps to change uh, on agricultural policy? Um, well, um, in terms of work that we've done, we're, we've been working closely with uh, the Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board, AHDB, who have produced a really interesting series of papers that look at different sectoral, um, sorry, different sectoral opinions on what sort of trade we should be aiming for in the EU and internationally after we leave. The EU. Um, we don't actually have that sort of technical expertise in house, but what AHDB has produced is a really, really fascinating insight into you, what areas might want a more protectionist stance and, and what others might want to be very sort of ambitious in terms of the international outlook. Um, and and the, the truth is that it very much varies between different commodities, um, and I think the concerns are generally the same across the board, although there's clearly certain areas of emphasis in Scotland that might not have in um, the rest of the UK, I'm thinking of the Scotch beef as, as one example. Um, that's something re really key, which we need to try and protect and ensure that we have geographical indications included very strongly within any future trade agreement with international partners. Um, so w we haven't got a document like that sort of in the running, but we are very much aware of the issues and very keen to try and strike up a dialogue with Department for International Trade, but I will be honest and say that they, we're getting very little to no engagement back from them at the current time, and I think that my colleagues in the NFU share the same concern. Um, primarily, I presume, because the the focus has been on getting the procedural aspects of the trade bill through first of all, but I think it's very key 
that department starts to look at different sectors and what they might want and need because as I said earlier you can't turn farming on and off and the uncertainty isn't helping um, confidence in the industry at the current time it's fair to say. Thank you very much. Okay Alexander. Emma. Thank you convener. Hey, good morning everybody. Um, I'm interested in tariffs and trade and, and issues around agriculture and um, protected geographical indications for our products in Scotland. Um, I was reading, the, there's a QMS briefing here that says that beef production alone makes up some 27% of total farm output and trading livestock and meat to destinations outside Scotland is fundamental to the long-term sustainability of Scottish red meat industry. So I think um, with the QMS briefing and the the other briefing I've got, which is the Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board briefing, there's lots of evidence out there that says, that, you know, WTO options are not what we want, especially with whiskey and beef and sheep and everything like that. But um, I'm just curious about, obviously, the NFU said that we want to, the best option would be part of the Customs Union single market access. But uh, how concerned are you about PGI status of our food and protecting our industry, our it's 14.4 billion annually as a turnover for food and drink, 119,000 jobs. It's not just the jobs; it's the supply chain. It's all of that. So, interested in your comments around those issues. Yeah, uh, I mean, in a word, to ask how concerned we are about protecting the PGI status and the sort of integrity of the food and drinks industry, the answer would be very concerned. Um, I think particularly there's been a sort of growing narrative in, in recent months about um, a no-deal Brexit, and that sort of thing is extremely unhelpful. Um, I think any sort of indication that we might unilaterally lower tariffs across the board and just kind of import and export on a, a world commodity market is just, it's just an absolute no-go area for our industry because we export on provenance, on extremely high standards, um, on the, the kind of the rolling hills and the USP that that brings to our products. And um, that means that we cannot um, kind of be a player on a sort of stack it high and sell at low commodity basis. So uh, we know what we can work to and what we can achieve, but that will come at a cost as well. Um, uh, but so long as we're supported by governments to produce that food to that high standard and, and the cost that it comes at, then, then we can do that. But we can't be undermined by anything substandard coming in from elsewhere and on the PGI point we were very concerned to see um, after the ratification of the recent CETA deal and I think in other deals as well um, notably with Japan that PGIs weren't included um, within those deals and when we looked into it with DEFRA colleagues um, the answer that we got back was essentially that they just forgot to include a schedule of PGIs within the text which does not instill confidence in you um, for the process moving forward so we've addressed that issue we can hopefully move forward and they're very much aware now that it's an important area for Scotland to focus on but that is just one example of where things could go drastically wrong for our industry if things aren't sort of you know the whole industry view isn't taken into account um, yeah. I was just going to add um, one of the reasons we feel it's really, really important to set a precedent for parliamentary scrutiny in this trade bill is because of um, um, future, so that it if there's another trade bill for future trade deals, it's um, it's easier to get that in, into that. Um, and um, it, one of the concerns, if we're looking back at TTIP as well, something we need to be really aware of is trade deals between the UK and the US. And we know that Liam Fox is already... Um, though there's discussions going on already at a high level um, with the US um, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, when we look at the, um, the US Trade Representative just published their Foreign Trade Barriers Report for 2018, which is a, 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 heavy, a very heavy, weighty document, 500 pages or so, but in that they list things relating to the EU that they see as trade barriers. So the, for, the, for now, we include ourselves there, but we can assume that some of these, these things would be the same when we're negotiating as the UK. And, um, and you were asking about GIs um, and what they wrote in that was, with respect to geographical indications, the Uni United States remains troubled with the EU system that provides overbroad protection of GIs, adversely impacting the protection of US trademarks and market access for the US. Um, there's also listed, uh, in relation to that, um, 
uh, labelling as well. So there's areas where they believe that barriers to trade are labelling, which tells customers where different ingredients are from, nutritional labelling, um, prohibitions on hormone beef and the use of ranctopamine, prohibitions on food from cloned animals, the slow appro approval of GM crops, prohibitions on GM foods and biotech seeds, prohibitions on chlorine chicken and other meat washed in microbial rinses, too low a limit on, um, I forget the technical name, for um, white blood cells in milk, um, uh, prohibitions on chemical flavourings, prohibitions on live cow exports, as, there's a long list, oh, um, and yeah, and the, uh, G, the GIs mentioned again later on. So there's, um, we, oh, we already know there's the, the difference in standards, but we could expect that there will be some serious pressure on in, in a, there's in a, during a negotiation between the UK and the US, for example, and this isn't, uh, you know, our, our position is not an anti-American position at all. That um, there are other countries that the UK will be doing trade deals with where we would have concerns about human rights, for example. Um, uh, and um, so that's just, that's that's another reason, I guess, why we feel that it's really important that pol that elected politicians have a say in these trade deals, and that it's not something that the government, the UK government, does. Um, uh, using its prerogative powers and without a set, without um, reference to the Parliament. Okay, I forgot to mention, uh, convener. I've got one that we saw. I am the Cab Six Parliamentary Liaison Officer for Rural uh, Economy, so I forgot to say that earlier. Um, the Canadian trade deal started out with 26.5 per cent on beef as a tariff, and it took 10 years to negotiate that to like a zero. So that's a long time to negotiate trade deals. I mean, can farmers sustain 10 years of 25% tariffs if they're exporting? And my other thoughts were about uh, somatic cell counts is actually what you're talking about. Um, issues around uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures which are used to protect human, animal and plant life or, or health. So technical barriers are often deemed necessary for environmental protection safety, national security, or cons consumer information. So these are the non-tariff barriers that you were talking earlier about, Claire, mm -hmm. um, which you know don't have tariffs, but they're really, really important that we get the right trade deals when we're talking about the health <laughs> of humans and plants and animals when we are uh, negotiating the trade deals. Mm -hmm. Just on your second point there, um, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we have consistently said that we want to be in some form of a customs union with the EU, because it basically would allow us, it, it would mean that we'd have be maintaining kind of a standard of production and not allowing stuff in that doesn't maintain those high levels and doesn't allow us to, you know, be undercut by all of that. So I think particularly for the red meat industry, when you're talking about home and treated beef and this sort of thing, that's particularly important. Um, on the tariffs with Canada, my limited understanding would be that as that trade deal has now been struck, what we'll try and do is essentially cut and paste the terms of that into UK law so that there won't be, we won't have to be paying tariffs to import or export at the current time. But it clearly could be an implication for any future international trade deal that we strike on our own um, and would be something that we'd be keen to avoid. But we'll just have to wait and see. This is an area I've not got a great deal of expertise in, I've got to concede. So could some, Claire, Claire or somebody please explain to me, in the PGI system that's currently there, how, is that, how do we come to an agreement on what should be as protected, that have a PGI status? What's the process? And why is, and I, I'm getting the feeling that people are concerned. The current process is obviously working to a reasonable degree. What, what, what's, the, what's the worry that that for the future that the process cannot continue to operate successfully, just so I can understand that. Um, well, what a PGI does is, is essentially give um, assurance status to your product. So um, stored away black pudding, for example, can only be produced there and to certain specifications. And loss of that PGI through any future trade deal would basically mean that anybody else could produce that a similar product and stick a label on it saying it's produced in stored away. So, is, is therefore it's taking away our provenance, it's taking away our sort of unique product that we can then go to other markets with. Um, in terms of the process of how they are agreed, I'm probably exposing my own ignorance, um, but it's it's a UK wide, uh, sorry, an EU wide recognised system. 
um, and that PG and PGIs are put onto schedules of any international trade deals so that that international partner then can't implicate or replicate. But it's important because there's PGIs on things like Scotch beef, Scotch whiskey. And so it's a, it's a process. So I'm, I'm assuming mm -hmm. then, and, and again, this is coming from a position of ignorance, that in these circumstances, whether it's Scotch beef or, or um, black pudding from the Stornoway, that the UK government is the one who, who is supporting that process through the EU to get these... PGI is put in place. Why would that? Mm -hmm. Why would the UK government, therefore, in future, decide not to have that same level of standard? That's. I, I need to get some of that on the record, because that's obviously would have an impact on any trade deal. Yeah. It, it may be something they ha they they have to trade off as part of the negotiations, for example. And we saw, Graeme, you might know more about this than me, but with CETA, they were very reluctant to list. The UK was very reluctant to list the PGIs. France listed. I don't know how many, but a lot. <laughs> there's 120 odd PGIs listed throughout Europe, and there's zero from the United Kingdom. So we um, so we have some evidence that the UK government is is um, it's not a priority, and and actually there's quotes from Liam Fox saying it isn't it's not a priority for this government, and that's not to say they might not change or future governments would change. But uh, sorry, did I cut across you, Emma? No, but. It's so actually, it's an important point to make because um, I think America is already making issues around whiskey, and uh, single malt Scotch is actually a brand that is so important for our industry. And there's a big difference between a three-year-old Tennessee whiskey that's corn made um, compared to a 12-year-old in a barrel on the island of Isla. So I think a distinction like that is is what needs to be made. That's, that's helpful for br 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 my understanding up to speed a bit more. Um, Murdo, I think you... It's, it's, it's sorry. important to reinforce the, the, the point that a large part of the, the, the food and drink industry in Scotland is based on the fact that Scotland is equated with quality. And um, things like PGIs and um, PDOs are ways of reinforcing that and stopping that being, um, being, being diluted. Uh, and um, that is a, a big, big market, and it's down just to the perception that people have of, of Scotland um, and the environmental aspects which lead to good quality uh, ingredients, etc., that come from, come from this country. Okay. And I think anything that undermines that will undermine this kind of uh, brand image, the brand Scotland, is, is, is an important one in certain, certain areas, but you guys would know more about that. Than right, so, well, Daphne, I'll, I'll let you in, then I'll come to Murdo on uh, an, another matter. So. Just very quickly, just to say that in all of these discussions, we need to take into account whether the UK uh, wants to have a very close relationship, trading relationship with the EU as well, because that will come in and, and sort of factor in some of these considerations, because we already know that the EU will not accept a very robust and close free trade agreement with the UK unless some of the standards are maintained, and they're talking about the inclusion of a non-regression um, principle, which means that there needs to be common ground on competition, state aid, guarantees against tax dumping, social standards, and environmental standards. So again... Close trade deal with the EU comes with a package of, of measures that we need to adhere to. Um, how does that impact our the possibility of getting other trade agreements? That's something we need to consider. Okay, Murdo, procurement issues. Thank you, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I want to ask about uh, procurement. Um, as we uh, leave the EU, we will no longer be bound by EU uh, procurement rules. Um, however, we will still be uh, party to the government procurement agreement, indeed uh, clause one of the trade bill, is a clear statement of intent that the UK will be party to the, the GPA. Uh, and there also are uh, provisions uh, in, in the bill empowering the Scottish Government to give effect to GPA uh, requirements using secondary legislation. So I wonder if, if any of you have a view on the uh, government procurement agreement and uh, this power on Scottish ministers to implement it. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I have to admit, it's not an area that I know a huge amount about, so I can come back to the committee to sort of evidence my arguments uh, in due course if I need to. But just taking uh, what my colleagues, the NFU, have said, they've um, 
they welcome the fact that the that will remain part of the GPA, but are pushing UK government um, to ensure that the government buying standards regulations are incorporated into any future procurement agreements um, with the Crown Commercial Services. Because um, essentially, I think these um, adhere to sort of greener public procurement rules, which allows more local procurement. This is something that we would also um, heavily support. So I can look into it a bit further and come back to the committee in writing, but that could be possibly something for Scottish Government to also look at. Anybody else got any thoughts on that? Yeah, no. With what Claire's, Claire's saying, I think in, in, in present times it's important to uh, um, think of the environmental consequences of, of completely open procurement um, and you know, buying local or supporting local businesses is, some, is something that should be encouraged. I don't know to what extent the general procurement agreement um, makes that difficult, um, but if it does, I would be against it. Uh, I think it's very important to support our local economies as far as, as far as possible, from the environmental consideration, but also from the social, the social consideration as well. Yeah, I mean, th thank you for that response. I mean, one of the criticisms made very often of the current procurement regime we have in the UK, which is set in the EU framework, is that it prevents us doing just that. You would agree with that? Well, I, I don't know enough about. Right. I'll take your word for it. it prevents us. Um, but well, that's, that's I, the I criticism that's often made. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. Claire Supper was nodding her head at that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we would agree. Um, in an ideal world, we would like to see possibly mandatory targets for levels of local procurement um, when it comes to foodstuffs in public services. That's something we would aspire to. So, out of the EU, perhaps that's something which we might be able to consider a bit more seriously. Okay. Thank you. I think James had a question in this area as well. Yeah, uh, just, just to build on that, I wonder if the panel think that uh, there should be a facility to vary the procurement arrangements where they, aff they affect devolved areas, particularly where um, Scottish bodies are involved in procuring uh, under the, the remit of the, the trade agreement. To give a practical example, um, just say that the... the the, the view that the Scottish Parliament took was that, you know, public bodies should mandate the payment of the real living wage. Um, should the should we be building in an, uh, an ability on this trade bill to allow uh, the Scottish Parliament to vary the, the, the arrangements in relation to specific trade bills uh, if it wanted to mandate the payment of the, the living wage? Well, the, the trade involved procurement from Scottish pu public bodies. Actually, I would agree with I would agree with that. Um, it's, it's a shame that has to be would have to be mandated. Organisations should be doing that, doing that anyway. M. Dills. Um, I don't have um, a great level of expertise on this, but that sounds like a very sensible <laughs> way of going about things. Yeah. Neil, did you still have some issue covered? It's been covered. Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Just to, to follow up very briefly, um, just to, to clarify, I I, uh, I get the sense that there's a, a an agreement broadly across the panel that the the policy that James Kelly was talking about there would be a good one, but the the question is at what level within the UK should it be imposed? If uh, indeed the the chance for more uh, local, sustainable and ethical procurement is one of the few silver linings to this whole situation. Uh, does the panel agree that it would be perverse uh, for that potential freedom then to be closed down and have the UK then impose the same constraints uh, on Scottish uh, and indeed local authority procurement decisions, that those sh should be made locally uh, rather than imposed uh, with the same restrictions uh, at the UK level. Yeah, flexibility. I think that, that wherever possible, buying locally and supporting local businesses should be encouraged. But the policy should be made at a local level as well. Well, I think that, well, though to my naive thinking, that follows on uh -huh. that to do that properly, the decision has to be made at a local, yeah. at a local level. Okay. It would be it, it would be very important <laughs> to make sure that that happened to ensure that the, that you got the results you wanted. Thank you very much, Claire. Are you on the same page as that? 
Um, I, to be honest, I'm not sure I've got a view here nor there. As, as I've said, I'm, I'm not an expert, but um, procurement is an issue okay. dealt with by Scottish Parliament at the current time. Um, obviously, we'd want that to stay that way, um, and it, it would depend upon the issue or the products being procured, I suppose, as to the level at which, whether it was Scottish Parliament or local authority or wherever that decision was taken, okay. um, I don't have a particular view. Daphne, have you got any views? I was probably going to agree with Claire that we haven't looked at this issue okay. in great detail, Fine. but the one thing I would clarify is that in any discussions we've had regarding joint frameworks at the UK level, we've always wanted the possibility for devolved governments and countries to take these further in terms of ambition, so if that could be worked in that context. Okay, well, th I, I very much welcome the contribution made by our panel today. That brings us to the end of the, the proceedings in, as far as the public part of the, the process is concerned. Could I just briefly mention, I'm sorry that I should have said before I asked my first question that my register of members interests shows I'm a member of Friends of the Earth, which is part of both Environment Link and the Trade Justice Coalition, and I should have said that at the start. No worry, well, it's on the record now, so thank, thank you, you. For, for doing that. You're safe. So as agreed at the start of the meeting, we'll take the next item in private. I thank our witnesses for their contribution and now close this public part of the meeting.